had over $20 million worth of stock in the company that was restricted. The smart thing for me to do financially would be to keep my mouth shut, but I couldn't live with myself knowing that they were lying to the investors. Another group of guys that had a $100 million fund, and that seemed so huge mm -hmm. when we were trying to raise $25,000 by Friday. And so for me to turn around and say, John, we're going to be a billion dollar fund, <laughs> it was incomprehensible. Yeah. This guy's opinion was so influential that he could change entire capital markets. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Welcome back to another episode of the Adaptive Leaders Podcast. Today we have a special guest. There's so many verticals that he has that you could create a movie on. He is a serial entrepreneur. He started over 20 businesses. Of those businesses, co-created an investment fund, $48 billion of assets under management. The most impressive thing he does, and he would attest to this as well, is in his charities and philanthropic efforts. He has started Child Liberation Foundation, and he's on a mission to eradicate child trafficking around the world. He has been in rooms with the top royalty in the world and the top business leaders in the world. And we are so grateful to have him today on the podcast. Paul Hutchinson, thank you so much for coming on, on the podcast today. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate you bringing me on. So I have a myriad of questions I want to ask you. And I've, I've been ingesting a lot of the podcasts you've been on. I know you've mentioned on other podcasts that you wanted to be a heart surgeon for children. You know, pediatric heart surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you wanted to do as a kid besides that? I wanted to be a business owner. Okay. But but uh, my dad, who climbed the co corporate ladder of his company, he told me, Paul, he says, you're not going to be very good at a business owner. I said, why? Why not? He said, because you're not very good at kissing butt. He <laughs> says, you're not very good at, good with authority. And, you know, we didn't talk about being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. His his vision of business was, okay, start at the bottom and work your way up. And mm. and he knew I wasn't any good at that. I, I, I tell people, I'd rather have my own hot dog stand than ask somebody when I can go to the bathroom. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so true. I haven't heard you talk a lot about your parents. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say? Who, who are you more like? Who, who are you more like your father, your mother? Uh, almost 50-50. Okay. My, my work ethic came from mm -hmm. my dad and you know, he was up at 6 a.m. every Saturday and you know, he'd come in, turn on the light, say, okay, time to go out and get stuff done today. And, mm -hmm. you know, my mom, she was a talker and she was a communicator and she was a traveler. You know, I think my dad would be perfectly happy staying at home every day the rest of his life, just mm -hmm. working in the yard. And my mom, she's not happy at all just staying at home. So there's there's that dichotomy there. Um, but from a, from a communication standpoint and a, a big vision standpoint and creating relationships, for sure, my mom. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, but the the ability to keep things super organized and on track and and uh, and and my work ethic, of course, came from my dad. And your dad, I don't think you've mentioned also what what did he do? What was his career? Um, he started out years ago in uh, in sales. Mm -hmm. for Intermountain Concrete Specialties mm -hmm. and then worked his way up in sales. And I remember when I was like 16 years old, he pulled all the kids together and he's like, okay, you know, I'm going to be making a move at work. Either I'm going to be out of a job next week or we're going to start doing really well. Mm -hmm. So basically it was his bid to actually buy out the former partners and didn't know kind of how the energy of that was going to work, if they were going to accept it or it's looking, looking at him as an enemy or, you know, a threat. And so he, he was able to do that deal and bought out those partners. And uh, he had a couple others that were in there as partners as well. I will say this, and I'll say this publicly, that the partners that ended up staying with him, I think were completely out of integrity mm. in every way. Um, mm. They uh, they forced him into an early retirement right before his his vesting schedule and his wow. his ability to to take a retirement over time would be would be paying out at a time when the stock was the lowest. He ended up trying to sue the company and they had more money because they were the company. So it was um, uh, any I, anytime I run into any of those guys, I'm like, yeah, I know you, I see you, and unfortunately in business. There are so many people that their perception of money and business is on a zero-sum game, and they think that the only way that they can get ahead is by hurting somebody else in some way. Mm -hmm. And anytime, anytime that you do anything in your career that is out of integrity, even if you earn extra money in doing so, mm -hmm. that money that comes in to you, you will feel guilt 
Hopefully, Mm -hmm. if you don't, then it will canker your life in some way or another. And so, you know, people who think that it's okay to hurt somebody else just to get ahead, I have no tolerance for that because you can build wealth Mm -hmm. with a true win, win, win philosophy across the board. That's, that's, uh, that's well said. My question is when you've been in, in the game of business and entrepreneurship, as long as you have, it seems like those stories are more common than, than not. Why? Why is that? I believe that it comes from two or three things. First of all, a misunderstanding of money itself and economics. Mm-hmm. If you are, uh, if you are a believer in the school of economics that says that the definition of economics is a division of scarce resources, and some some economics books say that it's a division mm-hmm. of scarce resources. This is a fallacy, Josh. There's there's more resources in this world than any of us would ever need. We could have all the food we could ever eat, all the clothes clothes we could ever wear. And and but people that believe that we live in that zero sum will act differently about money. Mm-hmm. In fact, a story I love to tell is back in the, I think the 1600s, there was a man who was knighted by the Queen of England because of his thesis statement paper that he put together that talked about the end of the empire mm. because of a shortage of whale blubber. Right. So, okay. We, we laugh about that today. Oh, that's stupid. Right. Mm-hmm. But the reality is so many of us think in that scarcity mindset, mm. right? We think that, oh no, we're running out of this or there's not enough money or there's not enough whatever. And we have to push this guy out to be able to make our, our family, whatever it is, a scarcity mindset will stop progression always. Understand that we truly live in a world of abundance, truly. We absolutely in every way we live. In fact, every single one of us today, if even if somebody has a, a one room apartment, a studio apartment, if they've got a microwave and, 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 and air conditioning and a carpet, they've got a better lifestyle, indoor plumbing alone, mm-hmm. they've got a better lifestyle than Kings did a few thousand years ago, mm-hmm. right? And so because of the the system that allows us to use our creativity, to put more things into the this environment that allows us all to have a better lifestyle, understanding money in that way will change everything. In fact, one of my favorite stories is one I, I, I read from a friend of mine named Paul Pilzer. He wrote a book called Unlimited Wealth. And Paul was one of the youngest presidents of Citigroup in his early 20s. He's been on the cover of over 100 magazines. And in his Unlimited Wealth book, he he gives a story of 10 men on an island, 10 families on an island. And every day, 10 men go out and they, they go fishing and they get just as much fish as they need to feed their families. Now, two of those men are creative entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. They come up with the idea of a net. And so together with their wives, they're sewing this net, they're coming up, you know, this family business type of a thing. Sure enough, they, they make this net, they go out, try it out. They're able to catch enough fish to feed their entire island. Hmm. Okay. Now the problem we have is 80% unemployment at this point. Mm-hmm. Okay. You've got eight men that now aren't needed to go fishing mm-hmm. and a dysfunctional government would tax those two men, 80% of their fish mm-hmm. and have everybody sit around. Mm-hmm. A well-functioning economy, those other eight guys, one would get better at building huts, one would get better at building boats, one would get better at building schools, one would get better at educating the children. And lifestyle as a whole would increase because of the correct understanding of economics. You don't have to fight that guy and take away his fish. No, you can use your time product- productively and create value for the world in, in your community in a way where everybody's lifestyle increases. That change of an understanding of economics, I think, is necessary for people to start dealing with each other in a different light. That The second reason, you ask, okay. why yep. do we have so many of these things coming up nowadays? The second reason is, honestly, is because we don't see each other as the equals that we are. Okay. Mm-hmm. You, you've, you've talked about your passion in helping people of color. It's so important mm-hmm. that we get to a point as a society where we don't even think about that anymore. 100%. Right? 100%. Where, where I see you as much as an equal in every way, regardless of your skin color, regardless mm-hmm. of your, your, your wallet, regardless of your achievements, regardless of where you live, seeing each other as one hundred percent equal the divinity that is in you in every way when we can all get to that point and see each other in that light our entire world will transform Mm -hmm. 
So that's part of the problem. Somebody says, oh, that guy's, he doesn't have the education that I have, or he doesn't right. have the background I have, or he doesn't mm -hmm. have the skin color, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. If you're ever, ever, ever judging another human being ever, not only for those things, but if you're even judging another human being for actions that they do, there's a 100% chance that you don't have enough information to make that judgment. People ask me all the time, they say, Paul, how can you go face to face with somebody selling an eight-year-old and have not have them right. see the, the anger mm -hmm. in your eyes? Yeah. And my answer surprises them. I say, number one, I love them. Oh, you can't love them. They're selling a child. No, I, I love the innocence of that child more. Mm -hmm. But I see them as the infinite being of light that they are. Mm. And I know that their choices are evil, right? But I can't judge them. I don't know what happened to them as a child. I don't know if they if they were raped as a child. They probably were, mm -hmm. you know. There was probably a thousand bad things that happened to them and a thousand bad decisions that got them to the point where they thought that it was okay to sell me an eight-year-old child as mm -hmm. I was undercover, right? I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure that they never, ever hurt another child again, mm -hmm. but I can't judge them. And if we can get to that point as a society where we can see each other with infinite love and light, where we can set parameters to ensure that we preserve the innocence of, of children and others and the freedom of all, but we get to a point where we can see each other as an equal and love, truly love our fellow man, we're not going to have those challenges in business and relationships, et cetera. So true. So true. That, that actually reminds me of a, a book that I just recently read called uh, A More Beautiful World or The More Beautiful World We All Know is Possible by Charles Eisenstein. Mm, Eisenstein, and he kind of addresses the elephants in the room, evil, uh, how, how storytelling or the way that we position ourselves or in relation to people who commit acts of atrocity or evil, when we separate ourselves from them, which is what most of us do, we, I would never do that, that guy's a monster, mm -hmm. then that separation is what allows us to vanquish the evil. So uh, other atrocities committed in the act of good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Good, goodness. Well, I can't tell you how many atrocities are, mm -hmm. are in the name of good. Yes. I mean, how many people have died in religious wars over so the many. centuries? So, so many. many. Millions. You know, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I realized a long time ago, I, it was super interesting. I, I had gone on a, a trip to, to Turkey with some of our investors years mm -hmm. ago, and we were, we were touring around, we went to uh, some beautiful places, uh, and, and there was this place that was about 200 miles away from the Syrian border. And, um, our, our driver had gone to bed early and, um, uh, there was no food service at the hotel and I was kind of hungry. And I mm -hmm. thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go for, I remember seeing a little, you know, some convenience stores. I'm going to go for a jog. I put my running shoes on. It's, it's almost midnight and I start jogging down and cars are slowing down. And I realized I was the only white guy in the whole area. Right? Right. I stuck out like a sore thumb mm -hmm. and the, 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 what I call the spirit of truth made mm -hmm. my hair stand up on the back of my neck. And I felt Paul, this is dangerous. Mm. Whatever you're doing right now is dangerous. You need to go, I thought, this is weird. I, I'm, I, go, I go undercover with traffickers. I can deal with danger. I mean, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? No, you need to turn around now. And I thought, okay. I turned around now and I got back to the hotel and I'm going to bed hungry and I'm thinking, why is that? Why, what was it that, 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 that my spidey senses and my intuition was telling me at the time? And I realized at that point that I don't fear evil people. You know, I, I meet face to face with most evil people on the planet that are selling me an eight year old child undercover, right? I don't fear that. I can deal with that. What is dangerous? What I feared are people who believe that they were good, who would oh, harm wow. me and my family based on that belief. Those men that were driving in those cars in that, that region of the world were taught since they were little children that Western civilization was bad. Mm -hmm. Because I don't kneel on a rug and face the same direction eight times a day, because we allow our states to authorize gay marriage, because our, our girls wear bikinis at the, mm -hmm. in public, whatever it is, if our way of life was allowed to infiltrate theirs, that would be bad. Therefore, their God will reward them for killing me, the infidel, you know? And so, so this is, the, I thought, wow, these people truly believe they are good. Right. That would, that would harm me based mm -hmm. on that belief. And that's the thing we need to be watching out for is where have the, the, the generations, the thousands of years of dogma 
in, in different ways of thinking and teaching come from that are teaching us that in any way, shape, or form that I'm better than you in wow. any way, right? right? It's coming from thousands of years of dogma. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Whether it's whether it's white versus black or whether it's the, the Middle Eastern versus the white, whether it's man versus woman, whatever it is, if there is anything that we have been taught throughout our life that tells us that I'm better than you in any way, that is a falsehood. And that was put in our minds by design by people that wanted to keep us separate, that mm -hmm. wanted to control us through creating contention. Mm -hmm. We as a people need to recognize that, let it go, so that we can come together in a true spirit of love and brotherhood and transform the world. Paul, I, I do want to get back on your timeline just to give a little bit more background. Sure. You knew you wanted to, to be a businessman. Your your father kind of was like, hey, don't do this, right? <laughs> do, do, do something else. Then your heart started going into pediatrics, mm -hmm. right? Um, why that? My heart actually started in pediatrics before. I was okay. I was literally, I have a... I have in my remembrance book, like in third grade, I, I did a report, a fourth grade, whatever. I did a, a report on the human heart, mm -hmm. right? Because I, I, I thought as a child, okay, I want to be a doctor. I want to help people, right? I want to mm -hmm. help people, but I don't want to just help all people. I want to help kids. And I, I realized I didn't want to just be a doctor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a surgeon because I got one life to live. I'm not just going to be a, just a doctor, right? I want to be mm -hmm. a surgeon and not just a regular surgeon, a, a heart surgeon, a specialized, specialized, and not just a regular heart surgeon, but a pediatric one, you know, really specialized and really focused. And, and so, um, and there was something inside of me that, that said, there's, there's a need for people to have healed hearts. I don't know where it came from. I don't mm -hmm. know. But that's that's kind of was ingrained in me, and then then later I saw my dad starting his business or going built, built working up the 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 chain with his company, and I thought, okay, that'd be cool. I would be just like my dad in business. Mm -hmm. He goes, no, Paul, you know you should. And he was trying to get me against that and going back into medicine. He said, you're you're brilliant. You've got you. you it's easy for you to get good grades. You're you've got a good heart, and you really want to help people. This is a great way to help people in in medicine. So that's mm -hmm. why I veered back onto it. Um, finished a whole bunch of my college credits in high school. And um, fast forward, I I was two months away from taking the MCAT. I got a bunch of my pre-med stuff that was all done, all my all my um, basic general stuff, and I and I I my um I was a month away from getting married, two months away from taking the MCAT, and and we got in a big car accident. My my uh, fiance at the time was driving a semi truck was was in this lane and didn't know she was here and, and quickly turned lanes and she just swerved to go off and lost control of the car and went through the median onto oncoming traffic on the freeway this pickup truck hit us head on separated the engine from our car hit us so bad i was in the passenger side and the last thing i see is we're flying through the air is this truck coming right at us and <sighs> boom severed the tendons in my hand and uh and it took I mean, I was in the emergency room for a long time, just scrubbing out. I I still have freeway in my hand right here. I've got wow. I eighty in my hand. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that was from twenty five years ago, thirty years ago now. And um, so th that was your life calling, right? I want to really zoom mm -hmm. in on that moment. How long did it take you to overcome? I'm sure you you were dealing with a lot of emotions and like, what's next? Yeah. How long did that process take you? It was probably about six months. Six it's months because they were they were repairing the hand, mm -hmm. and and it wasn't until then that we figured out well you might not have the dexterity to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. So, I um, had a friend, um, high school friend, that introduced me to a a guy who was somewhat successful in business, and he um, he said, "Paul, why do you want to be a doctor anyway?" I said, "I'll be honest, I I like to help people, but." I think it'd be cool to have the money too. You know, I'll go to school for 12 years so I can drive a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. He goes, no, that's not you. And I know that, Paul. He said, mm -hmm. he said you have a gift with people. Mm -hmm. He said, um, if you're interested in going into business more of an entrepreneur, he mm -hmm. says, I'll mentor you. Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm not going to give you any money. I'm not going to do any work with you. But if you do what I teach you to do, you'd be a millionaire by the time you're 30 and you'll have the time to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean time to enjoy it? He goes, go, go sit down with a doctor who's where you want to be financially. So I did the guy who, the, I, I got an appointment with the surgeon who did the work on my hand Yeah, and I, I asked him, I said, tell me about your lifestyle. 
He goes, well, I got a beautiful cars and nice house and part and a motor home, part ownership and a plane. I've got two teenage kids and I don't even know them. Hmm. I work a hundred hours a week to maintain the lifestyle and I can't, I can't retire because I'm tied to my Back then, it was my beeper, their pager, you know, at the time. And uh, he said, I have to keep paying malpractice insurance forever. And so it's, it's a difficult thing. And so I went back to this, this, uh, this business friend and he said, if you, if you build a business right, mm -hmm. you'll not only have money, but you'll have time as well. And you'll have the time to build other companies or have time to do charity or whatever else it is. And you won't be just trading time for money for things forever. Right. Which is a, is a whole other level of playing this game in entrepreneurship or in business, mm -hmm. which is, isn't readily available, right? There's not a school on, on high-level finances. There's not a school on funding or private equity. Like, there's mm -hmm. this level of playing the game, you leveraging uh, banks. Like, there's just, it's crazy. Yeah. And so, having a mentor, how old were you when that happened? 22, 23 <sighs> years old. That that sounds like a blessing. Yeah. For yeah. sure. And And what's interesting, too, is... Um, you know, he kind of got me on the right track, mm -hmm. but the most important thing he did was introduce me to hundreds, if not thousands of mentors that weren't going to be in person mm -hmm. on books and mm -hmm. tapes and programs. Somebody asked me, uh, a while ago, he said, Oh, Paul, you, you, you know, Tony Robbins, you've spent time with him, <laughs> flown in him on the jet. I says, yeah, I spent a lot of time there. And mm -hmm. he says, what was that like? I would, I would give anything. Well, I, man, all the things that he could teach me. And my, and I, I answered him this way. I said, what do you think Tony would teach you one-on-one -on -one that he's not already sharing with you in his books and audio programs and, and his, his conferences? Mm -hmm. He's given his best stuff so there. Now, now, yes, one-on-one, -on -one, you can go specifically into some of your things mm -hmm. and the coaching coaching is important there because sometimes you need a personal coach who can see the weaknesses you don't see in yourself and help you get through them. But realize a lot of these gurus that are successful in business that have that have put their ideas on on paper are giving you their best stuff. Mm -hmm. So so they can all be your mentors even if, even if you don't know them. Oh, one hundred percent. That's like that the way that I try to package this to my. I have a eleven year old turning twelve this this coming week, but I try to. I'm yeah. I'm trying to motivate her. Hey, here I'll give you twenty bucks. Finish it, but you know, like I'm trying to figure out these ways and so articulating it over and over how important and impactful this is. It's like there's no. You can find titans in every industry, literally the literal titans, the best of the best in every industry. And you can find after a 30, you know, 30 years of experience, they'll condense that down to two, 300 books and you can get their, their greatest lessons, their greatest experiences, their greatest teachings in something that could take you 10 hours. Mm -hmm. It's like, how, how much more potent do you need of a value proposition do I need to tell you to read uh, books from these people? Yeah. It's exactly. so powerful. So yeah, that, that, those have been my mentors growing up because I hadn't, I, I didn't have a lot of mentors when I started entrepreneurship at 18 years old, co-founding my first streetwear brand and, and then, uh, launching and scaling and, and starting, a uh, um, myriad of, of businesses since then. So, so powerful, so powerful. And so let's, let's go to your first, you know, you're in your early twenties now your first business was this marketing business, right? Mm -hmm. And that, and then you exited that at 29, mm -hmm. right? What were the, the lessons from, was it 22 to 29 or was it like 24? 20, what was it? 20, about 20 to 23 years old when I, okay. Yeah. I, I, I was working in some, uh, my mentor told me, if you want to be successful in business, you've got to learn how to sell and you've got to learn how to handle rejection. Mm -hmm. He said, I suggest you get some jobs that are going to teach you some of those things. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a job in a call center, cold calling, selling children's videos, and I, I got involved in a multi-level. You know, now didn't make a whole bunch of money with it, but I learned a lot from it in terms of how to handle rejection and, and the tape and book program, et cetera, that they had. And so with the, um, with the, the, the program that I was selling in the call center, one of those programs was for a gal by the name of Lucinda Bassett. And mm -hmm. she had the attacking anxiety and depression program. And I got so passionate about that because in my teenage years, my dad had given me an audio program by Brian Tracy called the psychology of achievement that, that talked about changing your mind and changing your life. Mm -hmm. And her cognitive restructuring program was, how do you get off of all of your anxiety and drug medications, all of this stuff, by simply changing how you think? I'm like, wow, 
that's right in line with what I believe. And so, um, so I got super involved with that. I, I, I got on that, that team that was selling the, the coaching programs for her, ended up taking over that whole account. And that's what I built. I started a company called Midwest Center Marketing. I built that up to over 200 employees with, uh, with some, some co-businesses that we were working with doing infomercials and radio campaigns. We ended up having almost 50,000 people a month calling in off of that infomercial. Mm -hmm. And the reason it transformed my life is because I went home every single day knowing that I was making money while making a powerful impact, positive impact in the lives of others, because I was giving them the tools they needed to transform their entire life. It wasn't just a little widget that we were selling them. It wasn't some, you know, juice drink, whatever. It was, it was a change your life type of a tool that they, we, we were given them. And, and that's, that was right in line with what I wanted to do as a little kid of, of helping people heal their hearts, mm -hmm. right? So if I could change, help people change the, their negative self-talk and their worry and their what-if thinking and their negative expectations or their, their perceptions they have of themselves or the, their perceptions of other people and how they're dealing with stress, these are all things that can be changed. It doesn't matter if you've been dealing with anxiety and depression for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. It literally only takes 21 days to change a habit. Mm. And that first 21 days, it's hard. You got to be thinking, okay, I got to change that habit, change that thinking habit, et cetera. But after three or four weeks, you can literally get to the point where it's not an uphill battle all the time, mm -hmm. where you can start every single day easier in having those positive affirmations and in and, and, and doing so, changing everything about your life. That's amazing. I want to ask you, is that your first, was that your first business, solo business endeavor? Well, Be, but, if you, if you cut out the the worm company I built when I was eight, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> you know? okay, yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah. The reason I, I ask you is because mowing company, but yeah, that was yeah. It. okay. <laughs> so the reason I ask is because it sounds like you found passion and purpose in that um, in that business, right? Which most entrepreneurs or or first time business owners don't even consider when they're starting out. It's mainly just how do I how do I replace my current I income if I have a career if I have a career or if I have a job. Um, so my question to you is, is is there a process that you have for these entrepreneurs or these, you know, want these individuals that want to start a business to uh, dissect that? How do they find their passion, their purpose and then create a business around that? I I think that <clears throat> I'll answer it this way. Okay. Um Ask yourself the question, if time and money were no issue mm -hmm. and I knew I couldn't fail, what would I dream? What would I do? You know, and that, that, that kind of starts tying into what your real passions are. And then if you can figure out what that is and then build a profitable company around it, mm -hmm. that's a win, win, win. In fact, right after I sold that company, um, well, I, mean, I don't know if you want me to tell the story of, I don't know if you heard the one about, about my ex-wife at 230 pounds. No, no. Okay. This, this, is, this is a great story. Okay. Let's hear okay? It. And, and it's about finding your passion. Okay. So I had, I had just sold that company and um, I was speaking to a group of entrepreneurs and business owners and stuff. And, and I would talk about how find your passion, whatever it is, identify. And, and, and I'm not going to judge you. If your passion is in, is you want to go to the moon? Great. Mm -hmm. Write that down. If your passion is in, I love sound and, and I want to be a, a, a musician, whatever it is, find out what it is and ask yourself if time and money were no issue, what would you dream? We, we came home from that and my, uh, my wife, she said to me, now, back when we did in our early 20s, right before we got married, we got in that major car accident and I severed the tendons in my hand, mm -hmm. she broke her pelvic bone. Mm -hmm. okay? In that car accident. In that same car accident. Mm -hmm. She, at the time, she was 112 pounds. She was a model for McCarty. She was on the Crimson Line at the University of Utah, a dancer, everything else. He's, and, wow. and after that accident, I wasn't able to play the piano anymore, be a surgeon. She wasn't able to exercise or dance. And she started putting on weight. And she got pregnant with the twins. And then she got pregnant with our third little boy. So fast forward at 29 years old, mm -hmm. I just had this talk about you know, change your mind, change your life and whatever you can dream, you can do it, whatever. And she said, Paul, she said, 
want to do something great with my life. Mm. I said, what do you want to do? I said, if, if time and money were no issue and you knew you couldn't fail, what would you dream? Right. And she said, oh, you're going to laugh at me. Now she's 29 years old, mother of three, 230 pounds. Mm. And she said, you're going to laugh at me. I said, no, I won't. She said, since I was a little girl, I wanted to be an NFL cheerleader. I'm like looking at my 230 pound wife. I'm like, you go girl. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> she says, no, I'm serious. She said, when I was 14, I danced at a halftime game and I, and I, I thought, wow, this would be just a super cool it's halftime game at like a 49ers game or something. Mm-hmm. And she said, that'd be so cool to dance for the 49ers. And so when I realized she was serious, and this is so important for visualization here, when I realized she was serious, this was in December, I gave her for, for Christmas that year, right? One of the things I gave her was a, was a picture, right? I went online and I found a 49ers gold rush cheerleader that was, you know, in her little outfit. It had mm. hair similar to Tiffany, but it was, it was obviously not same body, not same face. So I, mm. I, I did a Photoshop with her face on there and I put at the bottom, Tiffany Hutchinson, San Francisco 49ers gold rush cheerleader. And I framed it. <laughs> oh, right? wow. uh-huh. She, she cries when she opens the present, mm. she sets it on her bedstand, mm-hmm. and every single night before she went to bed, she focused on it, visualized. And this is so important when it comes to manifestation of your dreams, right? Mm-hmm. She visualized it. She focused on it before she went to sleep so that that vision of that new version of her was fresh in her subconscious mind before she went to sleep, okay? When she woke up in the morning, before she got out of bed, she would take that picture, hold it, stare at it, visualize it, and in her mind, make the goals for the day that were consistent with that new version of what she wanted to be. It motivated her to start exercising every single day, wow, two to four hours every day. Mm-hmm. And a year later, she had gone from 230 pounds, no surgery at all, 230 pounds down to her pre-wedding weight of about 110 pounds, mm-hmm. right? And there was 500 girls trying out for the 49ers that year. There was three spots available. She was the first pick. Wow. She was... She was at kids. I mean, she lived in Utah, right? right you know, right. cost us like twenty, thirty thousand dollars in plane tickets just mm-hmm. to fly her back for the practices and everything else. Wow. But, but you know, I tell people way back then. I said, well, but what thirty year old wouldn't pay twenty grand to have his nineteen year old wife back, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. So true. But, but the key to this is that you can literally be, have, and do anything that you can dream. It doesn't matter. In my early 20s, my my passion was in changing how people thought and changing their hearts. And I was able to build a successful company around that. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, fast forward, we ended up building Bridge. That wasn't in line with changing people's hearts. But I will tell you this, we built that company, company on the same principle of a true win-win-win. We would create a safe environment for people to live. We would create a a, a win for the banks, a win for our, our tenants, a win for our employees, a win for our investors all the way around in creating something that was of true value. We ended up having over 50,000 apartment units. So 50,000 wow. families had a better place to live because John and I came up with this idea mm-hmm. of building a fund around it. And so fast forward today, you know, people say, what's your passion now? I'm, I'm, I'm building systems around healing. And we can talk deeper into that, mm-hmm. but find what it is that excites you that, that just, yeah, if I could, if I could do that, if I could do that for free, I would do it just because I love it and then figure out how to make money around it because an energetic exchange of value for value is important. Don't just do stuff for free, you know, create that, mm. that exchange of the value that you create for the world, expecting that value to come back to you. Well, wow. that's powerful. I, um, I also wanted to, cause you already mentioned the fund. But I wanted to talk about the early years when you guys, I think it was either before the fund or when you and John were trying to figure this thing out and you always had that vision. They're like, we're going to be a billion dollar fund. (laughs) I love that because we're talking about core principles of success for entrepreneurs, business owners, but just in success in life, doing things you're passionate about, doing things you're purposeful about. You're going to work a hundred hours if necessary weekly to attain or to uh, to reach that goal. You know, a lot of the people that subscribe to manifestation, a lot of attraction, they miss the portion of the story where your wife was training four hours a day. That's the portion that they want to overlook. Yeah. They just want to say, oh, if I visualize it, it's going to it's gonna come. No, no, no. <laughs> the law of attraction is I'm going to align to the goal. Now I know which direction to move in, but you still have to go. Action. Exactly. You still have to take that action. And Oprah Winfrey says it best. She says, 
when I give it up to God and I, I said, this is God, it was, I did a hundred percent of the effort necessary to accomplish that thing, which would have taken me 90% of the way. And then God or the universe, whatever you subscribe to does that last 10%. Yeah. But that hundred percent effort, a hundred percent action was, was on my shoulders. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't God. You know, we're not just sitting here saying, please, why am I not rich yet? I've been, you know, well, I've it been... kind of is God because God works through you, you know, yeah, but right, you've right. got to put forth that energy. Mm -hmm. You've got to put forth the action. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you know, people look at me and John, oh, this lifestyle is huge company. They didn't see the hours that we were there until the entire parking lot was empty, except for our two cars. Mm -hmm. And that happened more times than I can tell you. In a successful company, you you know if you're an entrepreneur and you're in a in a building with a whole bunch of other business owners and whatever else, and you look out the window and you're the only car that's still there, mm -hmm. you know that you're hitting it hard. Mm -hmm. Now you also have to make sure that you have the proper balance, but you do have to put in the time and the energy to back it. Your your thoughts do create. They do. Yep. But but it's a combination with your thoughts and your words and your actions. You know, mm -hmm. the in, in the Bible says faith without works is dead. That has to do with manifestation just as much as it has to do with any kind of religion. Right. right? It is it is that unwavering conviction, that faith that I'm going to get there. I believe that I can. I've seen it. I visualize it. I, I've emotionally subscribed to where I'm going, but without the works, it's dead. Mm -hmm. And understand that that's a vital component of of your success in every area. You know, I I uh, I joke and talk about you know I finally found my my dream girl. I finally mm -hmm. you know after a couple marriages and everything, I I have a super super healthy relationship finally. Mm -hmm. And I joke and I say I created her because I I visualized it. I wrote down detail, awesome. detail, detail, mm -hmm. but I had to do the work mm -hmm. of the personal transformation of myself to get to the point where I could qualify for a relationship like that in my life. I had, I had not focused on those things of the man that I needed to be for the relationship that I wanted. Mm. I, I focused on the man that I needed to be to build a big company right. and the man I needed to be to go rescue, to kill children. But, but the but the man that I needed to be to have a super healthy relationship was something that I had ignored because I had focused so much on other areas. Once I did that work combined with my ability to write down exactly what I wanted and manifest it, then the most amazing things happened. Every mm -hmm. single thing on my list all of a sudden showed up in an airport in Haiti of all places. And she was, you know, I tell people meeting a, a, a beautiful Colombian actress is kind of cool, mm -hmm. but when she's donating her time at an orphanage in Haiti, wow. that's amazing. Wow. And she is 10 times what I could ever even imagine before in my life. Wow. But it, it took me doing the work to get there. That's powerful. And that vision that you have, um, is that is that nature or nurture? Did did, did somebody teach you that? Where where does that come from? <laughs> it was actually one of the probably the most important things that that mentor taught me when I was in my early twenties. Mm. He said, Paul. He said, Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna go look at houses you can't afford right now. I said, Why would I do that? Wow. He said, Because you need to see what you want for when you get there. Mm. You know, and and driving cars that you can't afford right now. This this is all an important thing, a process of you visualizing really where you want to be. In fact, it was, it was interesting. I, I, um, after I had become somewhat successful in a, in a business, I, I had a couple different mentors and one of them was a guy by the name of Steve and Steve had this beautiful Mercedes and a beautiful home, beautiful. Area. And I was mentoring this, this other entrepreneur named Dallas. And, uh, uh, I, I thought it'd be so cool to introduce this one that I was mentoring with my mentor. Mm -hmm. And so we went and I, Dallas was in the front seat with Steve driving his Mercedes and I was in the back seat, just letting them get to know each other. And Steve asked Dallas, he said, Dallas, he said, um, what's your dream? What, what is it? That you, what, why are you building this company? What's your dream? And Dallas said, well, that's the problem. Cause Dallas didn't really have a dream, right? Uh -huh. And he says, that's the problem. And Steve said, what was that? And I thought he didn't hear him. So I leaned forward and I said, he said, that's the problem. I've been talking to him about it and he really doesn't have his reason why. Mm. And Steve turned around and looked at me and he said, no, Paul. He said, that's your problem. Mm. I said, it's my problem that Dallas doesn't have a dream? He goes, yeah. He said, what are you doing mentoring him on the how 
when he doesn't know the why. Wow. He said, you need to figure out, you need to take him looking at homes, looking at cars, looking at pictures of, of vacation places, whatever it is, you need to figure out his why or you are wasting your time teaching him the how. That's powerful. <laughs> so what what is your process for somebody to uncover their why? Question um, is it a set of questions? Is it the Um yeah, here's here's what I do. Kay. So I I like to I like to take out a piece of paper mm -hmm. and I have a little teeny circle and I have a big circle. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the little teeny circle is where we all are right now. We mm -hmm. are all not where we want to be yet, right? This is the this is the money you have, the time you have, the trips you go on, the charity that you do, the your relationships, your car you drive, your house you're in, all of your everything right? This is your, your smaller circle. Mm -hmm. Your bigger one is ideally someday, right? And so it's super important. Then I, then I take this bigger thing and I, I break it up into p little pieces of pie, Ch -ch 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 -ch, mm -hmm. right? A pie thing around. Why? Because it's not just money. One of them is travel. One of them is time. One of them is security for your family. One of them is your charity work. One of them is your, your, your contribution to the world. One of all of these different things in your life that you want to expand upon from where you are right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want more time. I want some more money. I want some more, more valuable relationships. I want to have a bigger impact in the world. And if, and if, if your circle of where you are right now and your circle of where you want to be are the same size you're in a big trouble mm. because happiness comes from progression. We as spiritual beings for eternity have been receive this happiness because of the fact that we are progressing and growing. That's just how we're built. Mm -hmm. And that happiness comes from two things. It comes from personal growth and personal progression. And number two, helping other people grow and helping other people progress. That's where <laughs> happiness really comes from. You look back in your whole life, mm -hmm. the times where you're depressed, you know, when I was building the attacking anxiety and depression program, the people that were super depressed, they were stuck. They were stuck on all I had to do is get them get unstuck in one area, whatever it was, get unstuck in, start working out so that you're building your physical body, start eating more healthy, mm -hmm. start, start increasing a, a better relationship, better finances, whatever it is, if you're moving forward, then that breaks free from those chains of anxiety and depression. And so, so identifying what your bigger circle and make sure you have a lot bigger circle than the future of where you are right now. And then, and then ask yourself and write down on each thing, okay, from a time standpoint, what's ideal for me? And a money standpoint, what's ideal? And a house. And if every car cost a dollar, what would I drive? Mm -hmm. If every house cost a dollar, what would I live in? Ooh. If every trip in the world cost a dollar, where would I go? Mm -hmm. You know, take away the time and money aspect from your dreams and you'll figure out really what motivates you. And if you don't have a big enough dream, if if you have to wake up to an alarm clock every morning, then you don't have a big enough dream. Facts. I'm just going to tell it just Facts. like that. If, you, if you're like, man, that thing has to get my butt out of right. bed, then you're not excited Boy, enough about your day and just rocking the world. Mm -hmm. And so find something that just excites you. Your feet get out of the bed and they touch the ground and you're like <laughs> energized. <laughs> I got it. I got something that just excites me of where mm -hmm. I'm going in life. Mm -hmm. And so you know you've made it. You know you've made your vision board correctly <sighs> when it excites you to that level. <sighs> Guys, uh, for our audience, for the community, like, just I hope you're taking notes. I hope that you, you're listening to this. Pause, rewind, and do what he's, you know, do this practice. Put action behind what he's saying. Thank you for that process. Let's see, where are we in your history? Okay, so you've met John. You're, you're a visionary. You have the foresight. You have this belief, this deep self-belief matched with that self-belief you have massive action behind it but you, things weren't always rosy when you started out right i met john through the ashes of a failed company mm -hmm. that's that's how we met mm -hmm. is is i had sold my marketing company to a public company and mm -hmm. and i ended up finding out that these guys were more dirty they were mm -hmm. lying to the investors and stuff and 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 i I had over $20 million worth of stock in the company that was restricted. Wow. The, the smart thing for me to do financially would be to mm -hmm. keep my mouth shut, mm -hmm. right? But I couldn't live with myself knowing that they were lying to the investors. So I went into the board of directors and I said, here's the deal. I said, I just found out this, this, and this about the chief financial officer and the CEO of the company and the things that are really going on behind the scenes. I said, I'm... I'm going to Africa for a couple of weeks. I'm going to go climb Kilimanjaro. I'm going to, when I get back, if they're still running the company, I'm going to go public with the information that I have. 
and the company will lose it, the, the stock will go down to a penny. It'll never recover. Mm -hmm. I'll lose $20 million and I'm good with that because I am not going to maintain that financial <laughs> statement mm -hmm. on a lie, period. Right. Right. I said, but the only guy that I trust in this whole mess here is that guy, John. He, is, he was the one that took the company public. I mm. see he's outside. He doesn't know what's going on inside the company, but he's a man of integrity. If him or somebody like him are running the company, when I get back, I'll stay on and we'll, we'll make this thing work, but we'll do it with, with pure integrity. And so that's how I ended up getting close to John. As I came back, wow. board of directors had gotten rid of them. We did whatever we could do to, to repair the company. Mm -hmm. It ended up losing stock value because it was built on a lie, but at least we, we were able to pay back all the investors in the place. I lost money mm -hmm. a lot, but I did it out of pure integrity. Mm -hmm. And then John and I, um, this is, this is kind of a fun story. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever read about like the alchemist. So, mm -hmm. so the alchemists, you know, back in the day, they were, they were trying to figure out how to come up with a, with making gold out of just other chemicals, mm -hmm. right? They never did figure out how to effectively make gold at a cheaper rate than what you can just mine the gold. Mm -hmm. However, in the process of trying to figure out how to create gold, mm -hmm. they created so many advancements in medicine and, and in our, our world today in chemistry that our entire lifestyle has increased so much more than if they had figured out how to create gold. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's a powerful story. So mm -hmm. same thing happened with me and John. Right. We, we were in the beginning, we were, we were trying to, um, we had this, this money, we were doing hard money lending, mm -hmm. you know, bridge loan capital. We were doing short-term bridge loans. We didn't even have a fund yet. And um, I got a phone call from a guy who wanted to borrow a quarter million dollars to uh, to find a bunch of gold in Latin America. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds great. I said, "Listen, I'm a fiduciary. I, I can't I can't spend our investor money on something like that." Right. And he goes, "No, this is a cool story." Mm -hmm. he, he said, "He said Sir Francis Drake has this treasure dump, and I have some Navy SEAL guys who identified where it was, and some historians." Mm -hmm. He said, "I just need the money to buy a boat, and then we have to we can pull it up off of whatever." So instead of doing anything with my investors. One of my investors was a good friend. And he said, Paul, I mean, this guy could lose a quarter million in his couch and, and wouldn't miss it. And he said, Paul, he said, I don't trust that guy, but I trust you. You go down there. If you see the gold, I'll fund it. Right. Mm -hmm. So John and I went down and that's a whole other story. We're going to make a movie out of this story because we're talking drug lords and people trying to kill us. I mean, some crazy this stuff. This is when you first, you and John first yeah, met. We wow. first, yeah. <laughs> and so on the way back, you know, we didn't, yeah. we didn't hold the gold. We didn't see any gold, mm -hmm. but on the way back, we had a layover in Florida. It was like a 24-hour layover because it was a cheap freaking flight. So it's the only things we can afford, right? So, oh, I've been there. So I've been there. We're, we're in Florida, this this cheap hotel, but we did have a we we did have a, a hot tub in the hotel. Mm -hmm. So we had a whole bunch of time to spare. So me and John, we're like, you know what? Let's go sit in the hot tub for a while. We sat there for hours, like four hours in the hot tub, coming up with this idea in the hot tub of creating an investment fund. Mm. And a $48 billion investment fund, I promise you, we've made more millionaires than if we found that gold. Wow. Right? Wow, yeah. And so so the ideas that came from that trip mm -hmm. were something that would transform, similar to the guys that tried to create gold with the alchemists years ago. So. Right. Is there any way we could get a brief, like a, like a trailer version of that story? Long story short, okay. we fly down there, meet the guy that wanted to borrow the money at the airport. He's got to fly home because his wife's going to the hospital for something. He said, but stay here. I don't have permission from the government to pull this stuff up yet. He said, but I met a guy who I think is really connected with the government. I don't trust him yet. I don't know. I don't know if, you know, so don't tell him where I think the gold is, mm -hmm. but he'll take care of you. I'll see what's happening at home and then I'll fly back down in a couple of days, right? If she's okay. And we're like, okay, we're here anyway. So we get picked up. This guy in this black, you know, blacked out car, you know, black mm -hmm. windows, bulletproof, whatever, interesting, takes us to this house. And this is this gorgeous mansion, multi, like four story mansion with, with barbed wire going around it, with guys on every single gate with full automatic machine guns and stuff. And, and, and we're like, oh, this is an interesting guy, you know, yeah. but yeah, this, we were told he was the connected guy. So we're going there and this guy is. He's, he's, he wears a gun all the time. Mm -hmm. He's got some shady people coming in and out. We saw some government people come in and do some deals with him. And we realized within an hour or two, the reason he was so connected with the government, mm -hmm. it was the shady people in the government he was working with. And he was a drug Lord, like mm -hmm. hardcore Whoa. running the show, like bad dude, wow. right? And he started trying to pressure us saying, Hey, you know what? Why don't we 
go find what, you know, just tell me where it is. I'll, I'll take you out. I got the boats and everything. You mm-hmm. know, I heard that you guys found the, the, this treasure drop and we're, we're like, oh yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, no, no. And it was getting, it was getting more and more dangerous by the, by the minute. Wow. And John, John's like, I gotta get out of here. And we're like, Hey, uh, you know what? We're going to, we're going to go check into a hotel. He goes, no, you guys are going to stay here at my place. We're like, no, we're going to go get a hotel. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we, we figured out how to get out of the house into mm. a hotel, but his guys were watching us. Wow. And we're like, crap, this is dangerous. I said, yeah. I, we're not going to. So we, we ended up going out the back door of the hotel with our luggage and getting another taxi because um, his guys were out in front and going to the, to the airport realizing those guys were tailing us. Oh right? my gosh. We get to the airport mm. they go, what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh, we got an emergency. We got to go you know, mm. get out of the taxi. Right. So we're getting out of town. We get in past the security. I call my guy who was going to fund the, mm-hmm. the money mm-hmm. for that boat. And he said, Paul, you guys are already down there. I said, yeah, there's a drug lord that's following us. <laughs> he goes, he goes, wait till your plane leaves. Mm-hmm. They'll think you're gone. Just sit in the lobby for insight through check-in already for an extra hour. And when they're gone, go get your own rent a car and go, you know where it is. Oh, go out wow. and see if you can see it. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> so, so, so that's the, that's, that's the short version. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I will say that our metal detectors went right through the roof in this area that was the size of a, of a cul-de-sac in a, in a circle in a street, mm-hmm. massive area. There is something big underneath there, but it was so close to the shore that 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 the waves kept coming in and and this stuff was actually if it was real it mm-hmm. was dumped somewhere in the 1500s sir francis drake was was running away from, he was he was pillaging all this gold from latin america mm-hmm. and he was sending it over to europe and at one point he he had taken a bunch of gold that belonged to the Spaniards and they were mad, right? And so they were chasing him and he knew he couldn't outrun them. So he dumped it overboard and kept some records of it. But that was his last trip to the US or to mm-hmm. the to the Americas. Mm-hmm. And so that's what these guys believe that they had found. There's something huge under this area. And someday me and John are gonna go back down there. Let's go. <laughs> exactly. That's the exclamation point to the to the movie, right? It's gotta have a happy ending. You guys have to Go back and actually find the gold. Right? Exactly. That's awesome. That's an awesome. Isn't that a crazy story? Is that crazy? <laughs> and that was before all of that. I'm sure you have amazing stories now with with the child rescue stuff. Yeah, I got hundreds yeah. of those. Yeah, and that yeah. was before that even. That's great. You you have. It seems like your life has just been a, a culmination of many adventures. My my quote is this. Okay. Either either life is a daring bold adventure or it's nothing at all. There you go. <laughs> or it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> just taking risk. And um, was there a point in time, um, I want to say probably in your, between your 20s and early 30s, where, I mean, you were taking a lot of risk probably in your 30s, right? Can you train people to become more risk averse? Or is that something that they just have to go through? Here, here's the thing. I believe that fear mm-hmm. is our greatest enemy across the board. Okay. Not only in building companies, in having healthy relationships, in connecting with God, in exercising faith, all of these things. So, so if I was to identify enemy number one mm-hmm. as, as human beings, it is fear. And I believe fear is a fallacy. It's, it's a, fear is a, a, uh, it's, it's, it's made up, it's false evidence appearing real. Mm-hmm. It's, it's trained into us by our culture, by our government, by even religion. So many people will train fear because fear controls. Mm -hmm. Fear keeps you small. Mm -hmm. Fear keeps you from growing and expanding, which is what we're supposed to, that's what we're built for, Mm -hmm. is growing and expanding. Mm -hmm. So anything in your life, anything, you take a look at, okay, what, what are my fears? And all of us have some. Okay. Oh, for sure. What if, what if, what if, what if, mm-hmm. what if, what if my wife leaves me? What if mm-hmm. my child dies at school? What if mm-hmm. somebody kidnaps my kid? What if, what, I mean, there's a million of them. What if uh, somebody takes the money? What if this company doesn't work? That, what if thinking, you have to understand that, that fear and faith mm-hmm. cannot exist in the same person at the same time on the same subject. The reason behind it, they are the same power. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when you understand that you can harness it better. People who believe bad things happen to them attract that and create that in their life. Mm. People who believe good things happen to them attract that and create that in their life. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's the, the power, meaning it's the same power. It's the same 
principle that our thoughts create, that we, it's not just the law of attraction, Mm -hmm. it in reality is the law of creation, okay? Mm -hmm. Where our thoughts, our words, and our actions are creating a world of abundance or a world of scarcity, a healthy relationship or or, or an unhealthy relationship, uh, um, um, children that are going to grow up to be successful and ones that have low self-esteem, et cetera, right? right? And so so identifying fear as enemy number one Mm -hmm. will transform your life. And identifying anything in your life that that was fear-based. Did I make that decision based on fear? Did I move to that area based on fear? Did I, whatever it was, if you're making decisions based on fear, you're going to contract. Mm-hmm. If you're making decisions based on faith, you're going to expand. Yeah. Oof. That's potent. When John and I very first started the mm-hmm. fund, we were in, we were in an office that was about half the size of uh, I mean, it is yeah. tiny, right? Uh-huh. We were so small that we, when we turned around, we would bump elbows. Mm-hmm. When we backed up um, chairs to each other, so just this space between you and me right here this is about the size of our office. Wow. Right? Wow. And we had this this company where we were doing short-term lending and we needed to bring in some extra investors, mm-hmm. right? So I'd be on the phone, I'm making phone calls, making phone calls, and we need $25,000 by Friday. Yeah, this is a story. Right? Yeah, I love this story, yeah. And, and I'm making the phone calls and I would... Uh, and John tells the story a lot. How did you guys get there? How did you, did you see it in the mm-hmm. beginning? And John mm-hmm. said, well, Paul did mm-hmm. because I would hang up the phone after, you know, making phone calls and I would turn around and I would say, John, we're going to be a billion dollar fund, <laughs> right? Now, a billion compared to 25,000 is a massive <laughs> jump, right? Oh, right. <laughs> right. Almost I mean, unfathomable. We, we knew another, another mm-hmm. group of guys that had a $100 million fund and that mm-hmm. seemed so huge Mm -hmm. when we were trying to raise $25,000 by Friday. Yeah. And so for me to turn around and say, John, we're going to be a billion dollar (laughs) fund, it was incomprehensible. Yeah. And for you, for those of you that aren't watching this and only listening, mm-hmm. uh, he's he's doing yep. the Austin Powers. Uh, what's that movie? Called? Yeah. That movie? The Spy Who Shagged Me or something. Yeah. Where he's Austin Powers movie with the with the, the pinky at the side of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be yeah. a billion dollar yeah. fund. So funny. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and then, then at the end of the day, you know, I'm mm-hmm. telling John, hey, we're going to be a billion dollar fund. And he, I remember he said to me, he said, Paul, you know that neither one of us have the education, the pedigree, or the experience to run a billion dollar plus investment fund. We don't. Mm-hmm. We, we, we would work ourselves out of a job if we got that. I said, I know. But if we build it with integrity, we build the right foundation right now, and we build it in a way where it's ready to be able to expand to that level, number one. And number two, if we maintain that vision of what we can do and who we can be, we will attract the right people. And indeed we did. Within a, a few years, neither John nor, my, nor myself were qualified. We didn't, we didn't have the credentials to be the CEO of our own company, right. right? As it got that big, we had to have guys with JD MBAs from Harvard to be able mm-hmm. to, to have the credibility as we were going after these huge institutional investors. So yes, we had the vision, we created the foundation, but we had to bring on the right partners to be able to build it. So that that's a that's a, a massive lesson. Uh, the one of integrity. If you're building something with integrity, you attract those power players. I just I was watching a documentary, or a, I don't know. I think it's a just a, a movie on Bernie Madoff mm-hmm. that came out in 2017, I believe. And the I'm only halfway through, but the this guy built a Ponzi scheme of what's fifty billion dollars or something mm-hmm. investment. All fraudulent. Mm-hmm. Not one trade was made for the last fifteen years of that. I didn't, like unfathomable <laughs> how a guy could do that. Um, but I want to speak to that. How prominent is fraud and scams in the investment world? Right. In fun, in fun, it's, it's pretty in fun big. World. In fact, a lot of people don't start out thinking I'm going to build a fraudulent company. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if they are a person who lives life out of integrity in some ways, Mm -hmm. and if things happen that they didn't expect, okay, you, you take some money from investors and you're, you, you think this is a good investment over here and you put it into it and that doesn't go as well as it could have, Mm -hmm. you have two choices to make. You can take the, the point of, of true integrity and go to your investors and say, listen, I screwed up. Okay. 
or it wasn't me that screwed up. I tried, but the system didn't work the way that I thought that it would. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it is what it is. We're going to lose money here. But, you know, from an integrity standpoint in that space, all of a sudden now you're pretty much out of business. Mm -hmm. If somebody working out of integrity, zero integrity, then they would say, okay, well, that deal didn't go well. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to tell anybody about that one. Instead, mm -hmm. I'm going to bring in some more and I'm going to falsify some of the numbers and make it look like I look good. Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay because I'm going to, I'm going to pay these guys back because my next deal is going to be even better. And it's going to not only pay them back, but it'll, it'll cover my tracks of the one that I screwed up on. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But inevitably because you didn't learn any lessons from that mm -hmm. and you didn't bring in the right partners to be able to fix what you did wrong. And because you were acting out of integrity and that energetic exchange was out of kilter, mm -hmm. then the chances of the next project going well are actually a lot lower, right? Mm -hmm. And you have this other project. Now you have two projects that went bad. Crap. So now you owe way more money. But if you're out of integrity, if you have a lack of integrity there, then you want to keep making money for yourself. And so you might as well just keep bringing in more. And that, that, that addiction mm. to money mm -hmm. and, and putting that as a higher priority than, than your conscious, than your integrity, than your relationship with God, whatever it is, putting that as a higher priority will, will end up destroying everything. So would a person operating from a space of integrity, would that be radical transparency Absolutely. with LPs and Absolutely. limited partners? And that's, that's the thing that John and I did different than okay. almost any fund at the time. Mm -hmm. There were so many people that would call us in the beginning. And they, I remember telling these guys said, Paul, you guys don't have to, you know, get all this, this licensing with the SEC and stuff. Just have people put in a bank account. And as long as you know, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. No, mm -hmm. we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right from the beginning. We're going to make sure all the, and it costs John and I hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal mm -hmm. fees to be able to do it right. And then we had what we called the total transparency program within the fund where mm -hmm. our investment committee then in 99.9% .9 of the funds that were out there at the time, that was a super closed meeting. I mean, the the personal assistant didn't even get to come into that meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone any of the investors, right? Mm -hmm. A super closed with just the decision makers in the investment committee. We actually opened up that meeting to any investors that wanted to come in and watch. And we recorded it and allowed people anywhere around the world that were our investors to listen in live or in a recorded mm -hmm. thing, everything. And we talked about everything. If we had a, a, a fire or a break-in at this, you know, one of our apartments, whatever, we had to deal with the insurance issues. If we were losing money on a certain, every single one of the assets we would talk about on every single investment committee meeting. And that total transparency, I believe, was a key to our rapid growth. In fact, um, Stephen R. Covey's son, Mm -hmm. so, in, Stephen M. R. Covey has a book called The Speed of Trust. Okay. And and Familiar when he's book. doing his seminars, he because he had come in and seen what we had done, mm -hmm. he told us later, he said, guys, he said, if you're okay with it, I'm going to use this example when I'm teaching in my seminars mm -hmm. in this speed of trust. Mm -hmm. Your total transparency across the board to ensure that your investors know exactly what's going on, good or bad. And I think that that was a key to the foundation that ended up being what is now a $48 billion real estate investment fund. That's powerful. How many investors does a fund of that size have? We, if you were to guesstimate. Well, in, in the beginning, mm -hmm. in the beginning, we had to have smaller investors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause, cause we didn't, we, we didn't have the credibility with the guys who could write $50 mm -hmm. million dollar checks. Right. So we had a, we had a minimum in our, our very first fund, it was like $50,000 minimum. Then we raised it to a hundred and then 250 and then, and then a million. And I will tell you this, after we raised the minimum to a million, it was so much easier mm -hmm. dealing with those guys than the guys who invested 50,000. The guys who mm -hmm. invested 50,000 were calling me every freaking day. <laughs> you know, they're so scared they're going to lose it. The guys yeah. that put in a million that had a five, $10 million net worth, they, they saw us, they trusted us and they mm -hmm. knew that their attorneys were dealing with it. So as we built fund one and fund two, after we got to that million dollar minimum, I would say that our average investor was about 1.5 to $2 million. Mm -hmm. However, after we had our first hundred million under management, and 
we then we started bringing in fifty million dollar tranches or hundred million dollar tranches. Mm -hmm. We had some funds where we had some guys that brought in five hundred million dollars from one single investment. And that's like institutional, big investments, huge right? institutions. Yeah. yeah, and and in the beginning, this is one of the reasons why we brought on Don Hartman mm -hmm. is that John and I, I knew I knew how to go to the the. MBA games and make friends with the guys who could write million dollar checks, mm -hmm. right? I had no idea how to go to Morgan Stanley and have them write a $300 million check. No mm -hmm. idea. And so we brought on Don to help us have the look and feel necessary to go after the bigger institutions. Mm -hmm. And and that's that was one of the best hires we ever had because he saw the crisis before it happened mm -hmm. and called that crisis early. You know, an important principle as a, as a young entrepreneur here is don't be the smartest guy in the room, right? You can be the guy with the vision. Mm -hmm. You can you can maintain that control, but make sure you surround yourself with guys who are smarter than you in each of those areas. Don's resume was the most impressive piece of paper I'd seen. You know, he ran the financial institutions division for Citigroup in Asia. He raised like fourteen billion dollars to bail out the Asian debt crisis when he worked with Citi. He was he was. Uh, he was LDS and wanted to raise his family in Utah, but he was mm -hmm. overqualified for everything here. And he, he jokes, he said, yeah, Paul found me walking around uh, Salt Lake with an unemployed sign. I'll, I'll work for equity, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but finding power players like that mm -hmm. with the right background was one of our keys to success. So realistically, how did you attract them? You know, what, what was- I'll what tell you that? exactly what happened. I, <laughs> I, I believe that I attracted Don through my vision of we're going to be a billion dollar fund. Because okay. here's why. Mm -hmm. I literally- got a phone call from my son's soccer coach. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, Paul, uh, there's this guy in my neighborhood that I think you should meet. I said, okay, why? He said, I don't know, but he's got he's got it going on. He just barely moved in from, from overseas. He, he was like in big in the investment world and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so went to lunch with Don based on mm -hmm. that referral, you know, from my son's soccer coach. And all of a sudden I'm like, holy and for, crap. For context for the audience, how what is... How important is Citigroup in the investment world? <laughs> <laughs> to put it in perspective, yeah. at the time that Don was running the financial institutions research division, mm -hmm. Citigroup was the largest corporation on earth from a capitalization <laughs> standpoint. <laughs> right? Wild. I mean, they were huge. Yeah. Massive, massive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to to put this into perspective, because this mm -hmm. is this is why this is why this visualization and this understanding that all of us are connected to each other, to the universe, to the everything around us is such an important part. Yes, there are some systems that you can do and, you know, go on to Indeed and find, you know, find mm -hmm. employees, whatever else. But, but the most valuable ones are going to come when you are super in line mm -hmm. uh, from an integrity standpoint, your heart's in the right place, your vision's in the right place, and you will literally attract the right people. And um, here's my example. Okay. I believe Don was literally a one in a billion <sighs> chance. So let me explain why I believe it's one in a billion. This was in, in 2006 that we brought Don on mm -hmm. late 2006. And yes, his resume was awesome. Yes. We had to pay him way more money than what me and John were even earning to be able to get him to come on and right. give him equity. Mm -hmm. But he came into my office about two months later. Um, he closes the door and he said, Paul, he said, we're in trouble. I said, we are the, like the company. He goes, no, the whole country. He says, probably the whole world. Hmm. He said, we're looking at a multi-trillion dollar problem. Now this was a year and a half before the 2008 crisis, right? right? He said, we're looking at a multi-trillion dollar problem. And if you don't change, you're going to be upside down with everybody in your space. <sighs> now the, to, Don was arguably one of the top five experts in the world at analyzing banking cycles and credit crises. Wow. His job at Citigroup as the head of the financial institutions research division mm -hmm. was to study banking crises all the way back to Nazi Germany to ensure that Citi was in the right asset class at the right time in the right country, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So the chances of that guy, Don, mm -hmm. being our employee, our partner at the time mm -hmm. was one in a, one in a billion. Wow. Right. And, and he saw that crisis. He had all these third order polynomial equations that were way over my head, mm -hmm. but I don't know, no idea what you just said. I, I, yeah. All <laughs> this, this mathematical crap. Right? <laughs> okay. I was like, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I Don, I believe. And the reason we listened to him is that 10 years before when he was in Asia, 
Mm-hmm. And working for City, he wrote a series of reports called Asian Bank Symptoms of a Bad Debt Crisis that predicted mm-hmm. the Asian crisis nine months before it happened. In fact, he was so well respected internationally that guys like George Soros were shorting the bot like a billion dollars a day based on Don's advice. And four Whoa. countries took away Don's visa because he wouldn't resend his statements. Wow. Right? They thought he was putting their currency at risk. Nine months later, everything he said would happen did back in so Asia. So you're, what you're saying is that this guy's opinion was so influential that he could change entire capital markets? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's Now, insane. we didn't know that when right. we hired him. When my, when my son's soccer coach said, hey, you should talk to this guy. It's not, I mean, I could have... I could have researched for 10 years and never found that guy. Wow. Right? And to have the foresight, because nobody knew in 2006 that we're heading into a massive crisis. Right. Right. The 2008 financial crisis made the, everything else pale by comparison at that time. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, but 10 years earlier, and I didn't know this when I hired him, but when he sat down and showed me, I says, why, how come you know all this stuff? And he said, well, let me tell you what I did for City." And let me tell you what happened 10 years ago. And they took away the visa and everything else. I'm holy crap. And then after the bot broke in, in mm-hmm. Asia and the, the, the tie bot broke and the, the bottom fell out, it was the largest financial crisis in history up to that time. Mm-hmm. At that point, the international community wouldn't listen to anybody but Don and his team at City because they were the ones that called it. And they were, they were put in charge of helping to recapitalize these countries, right? Wow. We're talking power player. Wow. And and so when you say, how did you find a guy like that? Right. You don't find a guy like <laughs> yeah. that, right? You you have the vision mm. and you trust that that there is a lot more going on mm-hmm. than what your five senses understand, right? There's a lot more going on. Your, your ability to create. Now, yes, we were working hard. Yes, we were going to lunch with this guy, but but that's where... That's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. When you change your thoughts and you visualize where you're going and you're acting out of integrity, you literally attract things and people into your world Mm -hmm. that you could not have found on your own. Here, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell the audience why that's such powerful information because one version of that is Paul would have told you something external, some external, you know, uh, ability. He found a headhunter and that headhunter, he paid a million dollars to find him. And that would be out of most people's reach. What the advice was, was an internal function. And that's why it's so powerful is if you're aligned, if you're practicing in your values, if you know your passion, your purpose, anything that you're building as an extension of that, it's going to attract the people that you need to attain or to get to the next level. And that's why it's so powerful because everybody has access to that. That is su- a super powerful story. I will tell you that uh, mm-hmm. that nothing is static, mm-hmm. that they're changing markets all the time. Mm-hmm. I will say this, based on our current economy, um, there's, there's when you don't fix a problem and you artificially cover it up, the problem gets worse. Right. Right? So the, the bubble that... that the real estate bubble that kind of burst in, in, in 2008. So the mm-hmm. 2008 real estate crisis, boom, that burst. And we could have taken our medicine at that point, right? Right. As, as, a, as a global community, we could have said, okay, where is this unmitigated spending coming from? Mm-hmm. Where is the, the unmitigated money printing? Where is that going to take us over time? Um, you know, I, I like to say at the, the end of the 2008 crisis, imagine the economy is your grandma on life support, right? right. And the, 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 the feds have two levers. Their life support is lowering interest rates and printing more money, right? Mm-hmm. And that's their way of trying to avert disaster. Mm-hmm. They were worried we were going to go into a, a, a depression at the time. And they were rightly, rightly so worried, right? So they're like, okay, what we're going to do is we're just going to print a whole bunch more money. Technically not printing money, but yeah, infusing a whole bunch into the market. And they had something called quantitative easing, QE, mm. Q, QE1. Now, put it into perspective. Economics 101 is supply and demand. If if you have a trillion dollar bills chasing a trillion dollars worth of goods and services, and you print another trillion dollar bills, inevitably what has to happen, the cost of those goods and services have to double, the value of that dollar goes in half, right? Mm-hmm. That's just what happens. Before 
the 2008 crisis, before quantitative easing started coming in, before QE1, we had $800 billion bills chasing $800 billion worth of goods and services. Mm -hmm. QE1, QE2, QE3, QE4. To get out of the 2008 crisis, we had over $4 trillion bills chasing the same $800 billion mm -hmm. worth of goods and services. Now, the only reason why a gallon of milk at that point didn't cost four times that, like 12 $15 is mm -hmm. that the money multiplier was still below one. The, 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 the velocity of money, the times that money changes hands, mm -hmm. it was still below one. It was a, a classic liquidity trap that was happening. Mm -hmm. And so, so, and to put just, just to make that easy to right. understand is, is you go into a little town with $20, you pay $20 for your haircut, right? Mm -hmm. And that lady, she, she takes that $20, she goes, buys groceries. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy at the grocery store, he's, he takes that $20 and he pays a babysitter, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the number of times that the money changes hands. Usually that number is multiples. It's six or seven plus, right? It's, it's well below one and it has been for a while. Meaning every dollar that is printed, there's well, there's less than a dollar worth of GDP that's created wow. from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what happens over time is is if, if you are just throwing all of this extra money into the system, it's going to create inflation, massive inflation over time. If, if you as a government mm -hmm. decide not to take your medicine, don't fix the fact that you're overspending on everything, and you spend a trillion dollars more this year than what was brought in on the tax base, mm -hmm. you have two, two things that you can do. You can either tax everybody an extra trillion dollars and piss off everybody in the country, or you can print another trillion dollars. And what that does is that steals the money from everybody in terms of the value of their currency itself. Mm -hmm. You know, your parents have worked their whole life. They've got a few million dollars in the bank account. They think that they're going to retire nicely for the rest of their, their life. Well, that works if that buying power of that stays the same. Inflation takes off because of that unmitigated print, money printing, then you're taking away millions of dollars in buying power from those people who have saved it their whole life. And that's the disaster we're heading into right now. Oof. So what, what are you forecasting? <laughs> <laughs> I, one of two things. Okay. You're either going to see more bank failures mm -hmm. because the banks over the last few decades have built their, their entire business model upon low interest rates. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when you've got, when you've got interest rates now, you, why are they taking the interest rates up to curb the inflation? Right, so they're taking interest rates up, trying to slow down the inflation, making it so that we don't end up having heated up stuff where our houses end up three times the value and 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 our grocery bill is three times what it was. That's mm -hmm. what they're trying to slow down. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they printed so much money. Right? Mm -hmm. It's inevitably going to happen that inflation is going to go up, and so they're like, "Oh crap! How we fix that?" Well, you could have fixed it by not printing trillions of dollars of extra money in the system, but now you've already done that. Now what do you do? Well, let's let's. Increase interest rates. So they increase these interest rates trying to slow that down. What happens? All of these banks who are not able to sustain themselves based on those higher interest rate environments will start failing. So either you're going to see more bank failures or you're going to see interest rates come back down and inflation taken back up. There's no other way around it. Mm -hmm. we've, we've backed ourselves into this corner. We've been eating fat off the hog for the last number of decades mm -hmm. without fixing anything in the system. It's, it's going now catastrophically. It could end up being hyperinflation. It could be a full devaluation of the dollar. There's some serious things happening in the international world right now mm -hmm. that Americans should pay paying attention to. The, the, the dollar as a world reserve currency mm -hmm. is something that has held our value for a very long time. And if countries decide to start trading in Chinese currency and mm -hmm. Russian currency, et cetera, especially in the oil world, et cetera, and the US dollar fails to remain the, the the world reserve currency, then it's going to have a drastic effect upon where, and those countries that are choosing to start, I mean, a lot of them in the last few weeks have been pulling mm -hmm. away. That's something to be paying attention That's to. China, India. Yeah. They're, they're saying, they're saying, Hey, we don't trust the dollar like we used to. Mm -hmm. Then we have to ask ourselves, how's that going to affect our markets? Right. So. Okay. So how can the average person prepare for what potentially is coming <laughs> is there, and is there anything here, simplified here's the here's the easy answer to that okay, okay? if you and your company mm -hmm. have a product or service that is valuable in a good market and valuable in a bad market mm -hmm. and you can ratchet up the price of it based on inflation then you'll be just fine okay let's say that you are selling 
uh, I don't know what it is. You're selling selling um, some special kind of backpack or, mm. or, or, or widget, whatever right. it is. Okay, you have this thing and you know that people are going to want it now and people are going to want it even if things are a little bit tight, right? Mm. And if inflation goes through the roof and you're – your buying power of your dollar goes way, way down, and they take minimum wage up to $150 an hour for minimum wage, you know, a right. 10x or whatever. Then what happens is now people are paying a lot more for whatever it is that they need. Mm. For example, in my world, I, I, uh, my, my friends thought I was all crazy back uh, a year <laughs> and a half ago where I, I bought a ranch, I realizing that some of these things could happen. And mm -hmm. I asked myself, what things will people want no matter what the market is? One of them was food, right? I bought 2,000 chickens a year ago. Have you seen what's happening with egg prices? Yeah. Those girls are pumping out gold every single Let's day. Let's go. <laughs> right? And so I love that. people are like, what? This hedge fund manager goes out in the boonies and buys a chicken farm? Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's something that no matter where mm -hmm. the market goes, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. where the market goes. That's cash flow. Mm -hmm. That's cash flow and it's sustainability for everybody. You know, I'm actually looking. I know you think I'm super crazy here. I'm looking at another one that'll produce 30,000 eggs a day. Let's go. Why? Because, heck, if inflation takes off and eggs go to a dollar an egg, that's $30,000 a day, mm. right? If Whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's a cash flowing asset that no matter where the market goes, if everybody stops buying cameras and backpacks and if everybody stops buying cars and mm -hmm. going to the movies, yep. they're going to buy food. Yeah. So that's, what, so that's how I know you're a capitalist because most people are like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to homestead and how to survive the coming economic. <laughs> and you're like, how do I capitalize off of what's going on? Exactly. I love that.